This exclusive film was taken this summer by a camera team who entered the Kurdish-occupied area of northern Iraq by the only route open through Persia. This is the road to Kurdistan, although officially Kurdistan doesn't exist. It's the name given to a mountainous area called after the Kurdish tribesmen who've lived there since biblical times. The Kurds live in peace with their other neighbors, but in Iraq, for the last five years, they've been pinning down two-thirds of the Iraqi army in a war of independence. The only outside help they've had is unofficial from Persia. This petrol dump near the Iraqi border is available to vehicles taking supplies into the rebels. Russia, seeking a way to the Middle East oil fields through Kurdistan, once supported the Kurds. But the shifting balance of power offered the Russians other and more useful toeholds in the area. So, for the past five years, the Kurds have been going it alone with the tacit support of their Persian friends. It's a 600-mile drive from the Persian capital, Tehran, to the ill-defined border with Kurdistan. The last hundred miles before the frontier are part of a military zone under constant patrol by the Persian army. But the Kurds come and go as they please as far as Khanum, the last Persian outpost before the frontier to buy supplies. The Persian government turns a blind eye, partly to soothe its own Kurdish minority, partly because relations with Iraq are strained. More than once Iraqi planes have carried the war across the frontier and strafed Persian villages. Beyond Khanum lies the border itself. The watchtower overlooks the no-man's land between Persia and Kurdish-held Iraq. But there was a careful show of indifference to the film unit going in. No questions were asked, and just inside no-man's land, in full view of the Persian guards, a Kurdish jeep arrived to guarantee the camera's safe conduct to the battle zone. With the change of vehicles, a new guide. The local Kurdish commander had been alerted, and had sent back a patrol to act as chauffeur and reception committee. Beyond the border, the road gets worse as it twists up into the hills. This is the home of the Kurdish freedom fighters. Their enemy, the Iraqi regulars, have their main garrison at Ruandus. That's about 30 miles from the Kurdish stronghold at Galala, the first Kurdish refueling point. At Galala, the wreckage of an Iraqi MiG fighter shot down by the Kurds in a raid on the town. Among the buildings destroyed during the air attacks at Galala were the school and the mosque. The Kurds, though Western in language and character, still share the Islamic faith with their Arab enemies. For the past six years, Galala has been on constant alert for the daily whine of Iraqi jets overhead. It's the main supply center for the Kurdish warriors, or Peshmergas as they call themselves. The name means those who are prepared to die, and hundreds of them have died for what they now call the liberated area of Kurdistan. Galala is the only town where the Peshmergas can buy food, clothing and guns between battles. Ironically, they pay in Iraqi dinars, because although the Kurds claim all the trappings of a separate state, an army, a parliament and people's courts, they haven't got their own currency. During the fighting, Galala and towns like it lived virtually by night when they were free from Iraqi air raids. By night, the army-controlled administration kept the civil services going. The army courts met to settle civil disputes. The Kurds have a strict moral code. A bride found to have lost her virginity before marriage can be shot. In this nocturnal court, though, a less dramatic domestic issue is being decided. The woman is seeking a divorce on the grounds that her husband beats her. Here he is. 
The judge in the case is a Pesh Merga who left his family and legal practice in Baghdad three years ago to join the freedom fighters. In this case, the woman's petition is unsuccessful. The judge refuses to believe her complaints and dismisses the case. The Kurds are proud of their makeshift government, their race and their country. They've held sway in the mountains since 2000 BC and claim to be descendants of the Medes of the Old Testament. They've been invaded, conquered, forced to migrate, but have never submitted to outside rule for long. Their objection to being a minority race inside Iraq is that they stand to lose their autonomy, their language, and their pride. If they're to be part of Iraq, they demand full participation in the government and the army. For eight years now, they've been fighting for it, and they're prepared to go on fighting if necessary. The Kurds are undisputed masters of the mountains where the Iraqi tanks can't reach them. They're skilled guerrilla fighters. They can slip unseen amongst the rocks and their outposts give them a bird's eye view of any Iraqi troop movements in the valley below and allow them to dominate the road. From lofty vantage points, the Kurds keep constant watch on enemy garrisons like Rwanda's. 30,000 Iraqi troops have been pinned down there by a handful of Peshmergas with heavy American mortars. Shells are too scarce to waste. The Kurdish aim is deadly accurate. Watch closely and you'll see another almost on target. In one pitched battle early this summer, the Kurds claim to have routed 15,000 troops from Rwanda's and to have killed a thousand men for the loss of only 50 on their side. But usually the Kurds prefer hit and run raids. Before the enemy can return the fire, the tribesmen are back under cover, snatching a meager meal of cheese, flat bread, goat's milk, thin soup and tea. Nightfall, but no time to rest. Another patrol faces some of the 25,000 men of the Kurdish force. On the ground, the Kurds have the advantage of geography. So the Iraqis concentrate even more strongly on surprise air attack. A frequent target, Hamilton's Bridge at Choman, named after the British engineer who built it. The Kurds, anticipating one air raid on the bridge, sent three Peshmergas up the mountain with Czech machine guns. None had ever fired this weapon before. <laughs> 